the incumbent president, who obviously is going to be uh, sworn in again uh, in the next uh, 48 hours or so. I'm here with the um, current chair of the Finance Committee, who is going to be returning uh, to the House as a member of Parliament. Um, Doc, thank you very much for your time. Um, this must be nostalgic. This is the last city and nation address you ever witnessed as a member of Parliament. Yeah, every good thing has an end. And for me, after eight years, I think, um, uh, bowing out now, um, uh, that's the way to go. Um, the people have decided that they want to go in a new direction. Um, my service comes to an end, and so be it. What's your impression of the president's last to the nation address? Man, this, uh, it was concise. It touched, it touched pretty much on everything. Agriculture, the economy, health, Galamsi, every, every facet of the economy he touched on. And, and you could see his description of where we were, where we are now. I think this is one of the best state of the nation addresses I've, I've listened to. And it, it was delivered in quick fashion. And so everybody paid attention, and within a matter of time, it, it, it was over. Now, the, the, the key thing about it was what he said at the end. His legitimacy is almost being challenged at the Supreme Court, and he says he won an emphatic mandate uh, to govern for four more years. <laughs> I don't think the NDC themselves are challenging the, uh, the presidential result. They've resorted to challenging the parliamentary result. To all intents and purposes, they concede that the president won, and uh, uh, there's no shred of doubt as to who is the next president of the republic. But let's leave these matters to the courts to decide in the, in the coming days and months. For you personally, what's your future like? What's your, what's your aspirations going into the next government? Oh, I, want to take, I, I want to take a short break, maybe a two-month break, and thereafter I'll put myself together. Okay, but you, I mean the president again, of course, is going to be making a raft of appointments. you expect to get any? Uh, those are decisions for the president to make. I, I, I will lie in wait. If my name is called, certainly I'll be ready to serve. Thank you very much, Doc. That's uh, Roxin Dafiamek, who is here with me. Also, um, a member of the uh, NDC legal team, but he's also a member of parliament uh, for, for um, his constituency in South Dai. Also joining me is uh, Opon Kruma, who is the information minister. Uh, both of them are lawyers, so I'm happy to have them, um, a non-lawyer in the middle. But he's also a, a journalist. He still considers himself a journalist, actually. I write still, I am. Absolutely. Uh, Roxon, thank you for joining me. It's my pleasure. Your reaction Happy to the Final City Nation address? Yes, uh, uh, clearly um, he came to perform his uh, constitutional duties. Um, I expected him to touch on the violence that um, were attendant upon the elections during and immediately after. But he was very selective. Uh, he even failed to mention the persons who, who died, you know, as a result of the violence. And it's very important. Important because I know him to be a president who take very serious interest in life lost, whether here or elsewhere. So for eight, eight people to die during this election, for him to completely gloss over it, for me, is unacceptable. Now, he spoke about the state of the economy. He failed to turn out the figures. But, but, he, but he's aware how things are. And so would, we, we don't have the time to interrogate the, the entire spectrum of the speech. But I'm particularly worried about the posture of the present majority leader. He ought not to do what... What did he do wrong? You see, to say that people are living in a dreamland. You see, you are not in a majority by what you say. And my brother will agree. It is the figures that will tell you where you belong to. The figures we have now clearly points to a hung parliament. He's trying to diffuse that nomenclature. But he's not the first parliamentarian to, to write on, on parliamentary practice, procedure, and history. It's a term known to refer to parliament that, that, that are classified in the manner that we find ourselves. So it's important that we, we build bridges. But we don't build bridges and then he bends it all the time. It's not good. And that's all that I have to say for now. Stay with me. Um, so your reaction to the president's final um, State of the Nation address as he exits, of course, to be sworn in in 48 hours? I mean, obviously, within a 40 to 60 minute address, uh, no human being will be able to touch on all the key issues that have transpired in the last four years of an administration. But I think the top priority items are the ones that the president has highlighted 
and as quickly as possible given an overview of how he believes they have panned out during his tenure. I agree with the majority leader when he says that we probably have to devise a mechanism that allows parliament to interrogate these dusk addresses because the truth is that they are done at a time when you really won't have an opportunity to debate it or to interrogate it. But uh, it will go onto the record, but there should be an opportunity to interrogate it so that both sides of the divide can have a take at what they agree with and what they disagree with. But the president has performed his constitutional obligation. Um, yes, at the tail end, you saw, I believe, what ought not to have come into the seventh parliament coming, uh, i.e. both sides begin to posture on what the eighth parliament looks like. And that then starts a controversy that is not needed for a day like this. For a day like this, we have fulfilled a constitutional obligation of accounting for the four-year stewardship and giving a picture of what the state of the nation looks like today as His Excellency the President prepares to uh, bow out from his first term. And what we should learn from it is perhaps to find an opportunity to interrogate or to discuss it in the future. I mean, for, for you, I mean, of course, you are ushering yourself into the eighth parliament. I guess, you, don't you understand why everybody is anxious to see what the parliament, in fact, the president himself talks about how this next parliament is going to be any parliament we're used to. It's Absolutely. going to be different. Everybody's looking forward to it. Absolutely. Are we are all looking forward to it. I think it will be a historic parliament, 137, 137 with one uh, independent uh, candidate um, in the middle. And even we shouldn't be overly excited that he has announced that he will do business uh, with us. He could change his mind somewhere down the line. It requires a lot of compromise and working together, consensus building. Uh, I think that's a clear message that the people of Ghana have sent to us in this election. The president has articulated that, and that is what we need to begin to work towards. I think anything that here and now begins to now put fetters in that space, we should avoid and explore how we can work together and not mar the beauty of what is going to happen uh, in the eighth parliament. Congratulations again and thank you very much. Also joining me is the uh, minority uh, chief whip. Also joining me, oh, is the, let me stand in the middle of uh, the two leaders. Uh, is the first Deputy Speaker of Parliament. Um, congratulations for maintaining your, your seat. Thank you very much. Uh, and congratulations also for maintaining yours, yeah, uh, Muntaka Mubarak. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start with you, your reaction, you and the leadership of the minority, your reaction to the President? Well, I, I believe that the, the President, usually this last session is brief, as he tried to. But I, I thought that he missed the opportunity to acknowledge the loss of lives during this election. I mean, this is something that has never happened. I mean, I can't remember the last election that we had people losing their lives in these numbers. And I thought that as the president of the country, we should have taken the opportunity to acknowledge that. And that was a dent on our democracy, regardless of the circumstances. I mean, to get people shooting at collision center and people losing their lives. But he, he missed that opportunity. And I also thought that he was, he was being choosy, in my view. I mean, when you... you, 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 you want to talk about the economy. You remember to go and take the to, uh, four years ago his State of the Nation. He was emphatic about the mountain debt that has been left him. I thought he should tell this country where the debt stands today because he knows he has more than double uh, what you call it, uh, the, what he came to meet. So he, he decided to be dodgy. And then when he talks about abundance of food, it's shocking because I believe that the poultry farmers are listening. As we are speaking, they are importing maize into our country to be able to feed the, 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 the best. And it is well known. It's a fact. Nobody can hide about, uh, from, from that. Go to the market now and see whether you are finding eggs. All those things are in short supply. This is reality. So when you are the president of the country and you come and you say this, the ordinary person on the street begins to tell, to, to ask whether you are being truthful. I believe that the president, yes, he is supposed to be brief. He was brief. But I believe that when he also says the people of Ghana had spoken, they want us to work together. A simple ask, the election had been over for the past three weeks. What has he done or his government had done to reach out to the other side? You've not been reached out to. I can tell you emphatically, the parties have not reached out. Even those of us in parliament, nobody is talking. I mean, you could see what the majority are trying to generate. Caucus is different from the party with the larger number in parliament. And when we talk about the majority, go and look at standing order seven, six and seven. It clearly says it, especially at seven. No party had majority. After caucuses, it's people wanting to work with you. If you go and look at the constitution, article 97, gene and age, 
it's very clear. When you, it's like CPP, if the gentleman was a CPP person, CPP at the national level can agree with MPP that, oh, we work together, and therefore he will join you. But in this case, for the independent candidate, the constitution doesn't give him the opportunity to say that he's joining. He can only work with you. And in working with you, you cannot add that number to yours. You still stand at 137, and we've had that in parliament, where you, you will see in caucus working, yes, yeah, the person will vote with you, he may sit with you, he will work with you. The person can even change his mind along the line, all those things. So you cannot use that as a basis to say that, oh, I have this. That is why you must start the talking now, so that we avoid the unnecessary confrontation when we get there. But I want to believe the, 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 the posture of the majority leader is like, oh, okay, we are preparing our, our, our fighting gloves. So the minority or the opposition into the eighth parliament will also just look for a gloves and start preparing for a, a, a fight. I mean, so stay with me because that's important. There's a consensus building yeah. that the president has talked about a lot. We're just hearing the evidence there that there hasn't been any, any attempt to reach out to engender and nurture that consensus in the eighth parliament. I don't know who is to reach out to whom. The president is still the president of the seventh parliament. I mean, the la previous one. He will be sworn in as the new president in, on 7 January. From that time, he will be a president under a new dispensation. In parliament, the arrangement is the same. It is the seventh parliament that is in session now. The eighth parliament will start from 7th of January, or the, let's say, yes, 7th of January. Now, when it comes to consensus building, the chief whip knows that that is how parliament has worked over the years. Even when the MPP had overwhelming majority, we knew that you cannot work without the minority. And that has always been our stance. So the difference is not in whether you're talking today or you talk tomorrow. The difference is in understanding that in parliament, it has always been consulted. Even when we had to use um, Uh, um, appropriation, let's say, the word is eluding me. When you have to make sure you have six, one, zero, six, so you're entitled to six, I'm entitled to ten. That six and ten must be respected. So today, the only difference is that you may have nine, nine plus one. It won't change the way we do our business. It has never been the case, at least in the three terms that I've been in Parliament that one has raw, uh, reading rough shoulder over the other, never. And the uh, chief whip will admit that. When we can't agree, then we decide to vote. Where we, 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 we need a two-thirds majority and we can't agree, it doesn't happen. Like the case of uh, the attempted amendment of the constitution. We tried everything to reach consensus in the house. When we couldn't reach consensus in the house, we advise the president to withdraw it because without reaching consensus, there's no way we could garner two-thirds of the votes we needed to amend. I think he's making a bigger point. Yeah. The president acknowledges that this eighth parliament that is about to sort of um, come into play, you need to build consensus. You need to um, reach unnecessarily. But he's saying that in the process leading up to the birth of the eighth parliament, there hasn't been any show of goodwill from, from, from the side of the president to engender, to nurture that into it at all. I mean, there has never, you have already gone ahead to say who your nominee is for speaker, you know, and you, yeah, there's already threats I've heard about if they, they also put it forward a candidate, then you're going to, that doesn't engender that. The threat started from their side. Who should speak to whom? They started saying, we will form my majority. We will elect our speaker. We will elect the first deputy. I have also seen on social media a list of people supposed to be from their side. That is what you have seen. That is all. Everybody appears to be working with information they pick on social media. Um, but what you have confirmed yesterday, officially, yeah, that you are putting forward propose, names, yeah. proposed names. Yeah. When that has what's happened without any sort of, because you know in the end, it probably will have to come to a vote, and you need yes. to build even around that. But you've already put out your, your choice, and there's no regard for what the minority says in that. What does the minority say? They have also put out a name. No, no, no. I they, have they haven't. A name. 
I have I seen a of the names. I can say that that started last week with people on social media they abandoned a number of names for MPP and NDC. But officially now you have a name. But we don't. Officially we don't. But that's what we are saying. But we've not spoken. Because, I mean, like he's saying, the arrangement to usher the A parliament, there's a committee, in, for example, in parliament, putting the place, how to do the swearing in, how to do that. But asking whether there's any for how are we going to relate to each other in A parliament. There's none. And you could hear the posture of majority leader claiming, oh, they have majority. You heard him. So, and I'm saying that these are the comments that will not help us come around the same table. I can tell you, I spoke to Mr. Speaker, and I said, Mr. Speaker, yes, you are the Speaker of the Seventh Parliament. I can assure you that I sit in almost, at almost every level of our party hierarchy. There's no any talking. That is not good for our country. Yes, I don't have this decision uh, to talk about this, but I told him, and he said, Mutaka, I agree with you. I will, I will reach out. I will, I will try to tell the party Iraqi about it. Because I believe that was the presidency, because look, the presidency that we are talking about, the president and the former president and the people around them, we are friends. In parliament, he and I, I mean, we we'll travel and we we'll chat like 10 hours, not uh, getting exhaustive of having something to talk about. The, the party hierarchy, you, we have, you've seen after 2012 when they went to court, Dr. Kobneje moved us to the party headquarters to talk. I'm saying that they are not doing the same. Meaning that they are, they are just preparing themselves like, oh, you to hell with you. And I keep telling that this parliament, the A parliament, is going to be absolutely different. With that kind of posture, I can bet you they have a real run for their money. Have you confirmed your names yet? Your own names, no, no, your leadership? I mean, uh, it will be done, I'm sure, this afternoon. There's a, 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 a functional executive meeting that I believe may be able to finalize that and get it back. But I hear you, you're going to be maintained by Chief, by Chief Whip. I can't tell because, I mean, the, the, a lot of consultation is going on. Uh, what I have heard that I will definitely remain as one of the uh, persons in the leadership, as whether I remain as Chief Whip, which is my preference, but I can't tell until after the... the, the I propose a name for Speaker too? That's after that meeting, because that meeting will now finalize... What's the all. feeling among, among minority oh, members? Obviously, if the, those... Uh, our colleagues who are in government are not talking. What do you expect? We just have to prepare. So in that preparation, obviously, you have to look at who you may want to put up for speaker. Okay. Yes. So this will come out for a secret vote? Well, I mean, definitely when we get there. Okay. Thank you very much. You know, they are presenting it as if it is something starting today. Mm. The preparation towards we will form majority. We will forcibly take over the majority side. We will elect our speaker and our first deputy speaker. Started from their side. And now today they are saying nobody is reaching out. <clears throat> Maybe at the party level they could. But as we speak now, <laughs> I don't have the capacity. Who am I? I'm not elected to any position. I'm still the first deputy speaker of the seventh parliament. So in what capacity would I speak to anybody about the eighth parliament? Mm. But the truth of the matter is, the postures are the same, right? We have the numbers, we'll take it. <laughs> we'll say, no, you don't have the numbers, you can't take it. In the end, it comes down to voting. So whichever of us, of the sides, can garner a majority, we we'll choose which one. I don't want us to start talking about, okay, give and take, take this, I take that. Because in the end, then we are not going by voting. What is the practice? Our practice is that it is um, caucuses, and our, uh, our orders are clear. The party or parties that form the majority is the majority caucus. So the party or parties. But, but, they, but the independent, can, they cannot, can it be construed as a yes. party? Yes. You that's represent subject, to inter it's subject to interpretation. Whose interpretation? It, you represent yourself. Mm. You represent yourself, mm. so you're independent. Mm. You're a party yeah. in that sense. I mean, you, you, yourself, you're still your first deputy speaker of parliament. I mean, are you going to be maintained? I believe so. Okay. In the but eighth in parliament? The end, it's voting. Yes, so yes. if I get voted for, then I'll be maintained. But there's a 
interesting question of the third, the second deputy speaker, Palu, who must come from another party. Yes. Is the party willing to play ball with the NDC on that? Why not? That has been our practice. The only time that that changed, because when uh, when MPP NDC proposed a candidate for the speaker, and then they said, three. if you do that, then we also propose a candidate for the second deputy. That's the only time that happened. Okay, but you don't, in this case, you don't have a choice because the, in the independent candidate is the only person you have in the, in the third place. Well, if it becomes necessary, we'll put him there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, also joining me right now is the um, minority leader uh, in the seventh parliament, um, in the eighth parliament that is about to play out. We don't know yet. I, I'm, I'm told some conversation have already started about your own leadership going to eighth. Uh, I'm now aspiring majority leader. Okay. with Techima and uh, Sefi to be secured. Oh, if that travesty of electoral injustice against the NDC is reversed, as it should, in the interest of justice and peace, we would form a majority. What I do know is that the 2020 election produced an inevitable outcome of no majority party in parliament. 137, 137 is equal. So it's even wrong for the president to say almost equal. What is almost equal? It's 128, 128 is almost equal. He got it mathematically wrong. And, but for the fact that they used state apparatus in collusion with the EC to deny Stechima, it would have been interesting where the balance of power would be for Ghana. My worry is that the president was conspicuously quiet about the huge debt he's living for Ghana the IMF projects a debt of 297 billion with interest payment, less principal and amortization to be 24 billion into 2021. And it means that uh, the president too must accept responsibility that he has contributed to fracturing uh, our democracy. Uh, our democracy is not as it used to be 10 years ago. I mean, for the first time in our history, arising out of coalition of resource and declaration of resource, aid laws, lives, and he's silent on it. That is unacceptable. He must take responsibility. Those lives needn't be lost in a genuine, transparent, democratic process. He was dead silent on that. That's not acceptable. Mm. He must investigate it, punish people. <laughs> they are interested in people who are processing and rioting. They must the, be the state in institutions, they've argued, is doing it. The police are doing it. CID says they are looking into it. They are doing what? So follow through. Those uh, who shot and killed people are walking free. Is that the democracy you want? And then many of you in Ghana miss the point. You see, it's not about Techima South. It's about tomorrow. That in Tamale South, after resource, I just walk in and say, okay, Haruna Idrisu, one, two, five thousand, MPP, 25,000, walk away. Ask the electoral officer, then I'm walking away. Is that the future of our democracy? So Techima South is to fight that systems must work, institutions must work, and they must work creditably and in accordance with law. Jean Mercer corrected herself six times. Did she go to court to correct herself? She used administrative processes and procedures. We simply ask for same. Use the same administrative processes and procedure to right your own wrongs. Then she says go to court because she knows it's tortuous and cumbersome and outcomes may not be today when they would have secured some decisions that they are undeserving. So my disappointment in Dagbang, the president says he's created Dagbang. The Yan Nas uh, authority and mandate have been questioned in many instances, including Nantong and Karga. So the absence of war is not peace. He shouldn't think that all is well. When the president says that the eighth parliament demands that you build consensus, you think he's being sincere? He is compelled to. That is not his wish. It's what the Ghanaian people impose on him and he must respect it. He didn't win parliament, nothing more. He should respect the principle and notion and practical operation of the doctrine of separation of powers. He's an executive president. He lost parliament. He lost it. He just forced him to add Techima and to add Sefi, as you saw. And uh, it's, 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 it's disappointing. Then cost of living. Uh, and quality of life is deteriorating in Ghana. Read the statistical service and the UNDP report in Ghana. And he talks about Ghana exporting food. A bag of maize, as I heard from my mother for the first time, is now selling for more than 200 Ghana cities in Tamale. That has never ever happened. A bag of corn. I use ordinary people to uh, 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 measure it. And then he prides himself with 1D, 1F. 
1D, 1F not equitably distributed. Many other regions of Ghana, Upper West is lacking, Upper East is lacking, Savannah is lacking, Northern region is lacking. All the factories are concentrated in Accra and Tema. That is not equity. That is not equity. And then also, he's come to Parliament with a number of questionable tax exemptions, just giving away money to friends and family members in the name of tax exemption, in the name of 1D, 1F. My understanding of it was that 1D, 1F should contribute to job creation. And then the President again was dead silent on the growing unemployment in our country. Uh, young men and women turning out of the universities, whether universities or polytechnics, are unemployed. What are we doing about it? You do youth employment and give people 100 Ghana cities. NAPCO employees are not even on SNIT. NAPCO employees have no training. And after one or two months, they have, get, they, they have to get back home. That is not sustainable. If you are to give a verdict on his assessment of the state of the nation, what would your verdict be? I used to have enormous respect for Nana Akufuadu as somebody who have held the rule of law, belief, and faith in democracy, but his conduct in the 2020 election is disappointing. I mean, when President Muhammad lost, he lost. He considered defeat. There is nothing like forcing to stay. That's why people are dying, because you are imposing yourself. And then every president gets it easy on the second term. But for him, why, what happened? With all the COVID money spent, we'll be investigating COVID and the money they spend on election instead of spending it on COVID to protect life on public health. They didn't spend the COVID money on public health. They were dishing it around and sharing it around men and women across the country to get vote. And the media, you must be interested in one of the most dangerous things Nanado has done to our democracy is the huge dosage of money he used in this election. Going forward, that will undermine the integrity of any democratic process, any competitive democratic process. It has never ever happened. Even at polling stations, people sharing money and putting money in masks for voters, and you think that that gives you a democracy? I'm sorry. So that is the that is the minority leader there uh, talking to us on the, his reaction to the uh, state of the nation uh, address uh, that was just delivered by the president. Um, my colleagues, um, Winston Amwa and uh, uh, and and Kojo Yang Singh are joining me, obviously, uh, as we begin to analyze what we've heard already and all the reactions that are beginning to play out. Um, Winston, there's few things that stuck 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 to me. Towards the end of the president's speech, we all know what is happening in the context of the elections, right? And he's, he makes the point quite forcefully that he's been given a resounding death in Monday. And you see the room then erupts, right, when he said that. And that, of course, he applauds the fact that the uh, opposition leader, as in the John Mahama, has decided to finally go to court instead of resorting to um, what he claims to be a violation of the Public Order Act and, 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 and such, as, such as he has. What's your reaction to, to that? I mean, making the point about the outcome of the elections and how he believes to, he's got that resounding mandate, although, of course, we know that his, his election itself is a subject of a court action. Well, um, Evans, you know, once the president comes to parliament, he's also talking to all Ghanaians. And once he's speaking to all Ghanaians, you have um, a lot of his supporters in there. What they need now is a bit of um, you know that statement from the president that tells them that look we want this because out there if you should speak to NPP members and NDC members the NDC seems to the NDC says all the time that can't you see they can't even celebrate they can't celebrate because they didn't win this genuinely and for him as the president he needs to send that signal that we want this and look John Mahama in 2012 wanted about 300,000 500,000 votes is a lot but certainly not what the NPP would have expected based on all the things they trumpeted and based on all the things they said they had achieved over the four years and that's when for a, a four more to do more. So while he might push that out, you can also argue that clearly it's a way of galvanizing the party base to tell them, you know what, we didn't lose this as you may think we did. We actually won this because if we should go into our recent past, the NDC's second term with John Mahama led, even after the death of John, uh, John Evans at Tamils, uh, where you would expect that a lot of people would say, we sympathize with the NDC, they couldn't beat us that much as we have beaten them. And so that for me is um, how I see it. A president trying to governize his base, trying to send a signal to them that, you know what, we won this and won this with huge margin. When it comes to the bit about the NDC 
deciding to go to court finally and not violating the public order act. Look, look. The NDC in some of the instances had written to the police to indicate they were going to embark on these walks, okay, or these protests. There is spontaneity sometimes. And Nanado should be the last person to speak against that. Because we know the spontaneous reaction of his party members when, they were to, uh, when the declaration was made in 2012. Okay? Even though we do, you don't want to justify people violating laws, but you must also add a bit of purposive approach to doing things and must also sometimes look at it not just from the black and white. People can spontaneously gather. Even though we want to ensure that the right things are done, it is the only reason why during elections we deploy more security personnel. Okay? So, yes, uh, members of parliament, well, they said their party had indicated we we're going to go on walk, so a case that is in court is not for me to talk about. But the NDC, you and I have discussed this before. What the NDC sought to do was also to win the case in the court of public opinion mm -hmm. before going to court. And already, you may have heard a lot of some of their members suggesting that, well, they believe, even if they don't win, they know that they won the election, even if they don't win the court yeah, case. I mean, in fact, and the MPP still believe they won the 2012 elections. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean but, but, so we had the president today. Did he meet your expectation? Um, I've got to say that the things he said are relevant to the state of our nation. But perhaps there was a lot more that we could have heard him speak on. Um, you know, the state of our nation sometimes also has to do with the state of our nation in relation to other nations. You know, and yes, we heard about the African Free Trade uh, Agreement and the fact that uh, he is uh, chair of ECOWAS and so forth. But uh, there must also be questions about how far we have advanced in relation to other nations when it comes to things like uh, poverty, uh, you know, poverty eradication, uh, knowledge and so forth. So I would have liked to hear a little bit of that as well. Uh, I would also have preferred that the areas where there is controversy about whether we can call them successes or failures, that he had acknowledged that controversy. For example, he mentioned one constituency, one, um, one million dollars. Uh, but he said it in a, way, in a different way. He talked about how now every constituency has an ambulance. Okay, that doesn't really speak to whether or not we have achieved one constituency, one million dollars, which was the promise. Okay, so we know that two years passed without any constituency getting a million dollars. We know that the issue of a constituency not being a, an administrative unit is still not resolved. So we know that when it comes to that particular uh, policy, there are areas of contention. I would have liked to hear the president say, in spite of these areas of contention, we have still managed to get an ambulance for every constituency. But to tout it as an entire you know, success, and he did that with several other issues, and I feel like perhaps... Another it, issue that struck me in line with that was when he talks about Galam Say. Uh -huh. And then he says that we need to have a conversation about Galam Say, whether or not to allow it uh, as an issue, and that we are destroying the environment. That and I thought, me. That, that shocked me. That, I think shocked that, was, that was a big deal for me because I, just before we came, I had checked his 2020 City of the Nation in which that time it was on the aftermath of the missing excavators and he gave an account of how 12,000 excavators have been seized some funds and have some of them been bent some of them have gone missing and they have been investigated yeah. up till today i don't know if you know you can show me i don't know the outcome of that investigation into the missing excavators and and the apparent as some have said failure mm. right in in seeing through that fight that he began Absolutely. right and so i was expecting something more to of the point of accounting mm. because he, he he almost staked his presidency on the fight against galam say I, I think you're absolutely right he did stake his presidency on it he said he's prepared to put his presidency on the line but today you hear him say we have to have a conversation about whether to allow it uh, it, it sounds to me like somebody who has decided that Fighting it and winning is no longer uh, one of the things he can do. Therefore, a new tack is required. Now, it's not strange to see a politician take a new tack, and the president is a politician. But I think of the impact of this on all the people who are affected by our degraded environment, our lack of water, 
all the people who are affected by the fact that foreigners come into this country and somehow are able to bring in equipment that, that is illegal and use it to decimate our environment. Mm. This thing was something that, I mean, gave the nation a headache. And the president said he had the Panadol. But now he says, maybe we should think about whether or not we want to live with this headache. Yeah. I, I feel like there are people across the nation who will hear that today and be disappointed. But here's the thing though, he staked his presidency on it. He won the elections. The people gave him a second mandate, right? Isn't that the, the people's verdict of faith in him as in having executed, they are happy with what he's done with Gallam Singh, so they've accepted, renewed his mandate. I would have accepted that if he had staked his, his re-election on it. He staked his presidency on it. Okay, and his president. And the survival of his presidency is at the behest of the voters in elections. No, that's just his re-election. His presidency goes on for four years, during which nobody is voting. So if he stakes his presidency on it, that is a very, very big claim that he made. Okay, and the suggestion here is that if he fails to, to end Galamse, or if he fails to deal with the Galamse problem, his presidency should be sacrificed. Yeah, okay. but, the, but the people said they gave him a mandate. Isn't that an endorsement of I mean, his fight against Galamse? Let me, let me take a, a connotative meaning of this and say, when, I, when we say I put my presidency on the line, it means that my re-election is on the line. And this is the reason. When the president was asked that question in, the, in his first meet the press, the answer he gave was that, I don't even know if my party would nominate me as its flag bearer. But whatever it is, I have told you that I am prepared, even if it will cost me yeah. right, to put this on. And so if, if someone tells you in, in, in Ghana, I put this on the line, and if the president says, I put my presidency on the line, with every president expected to run for a second term, and the reason why we have the convention of not being challenged, the president was telling you, it is my election I'm putting on the line. But let me say something. You talked about the one million one, cons uh, yeah. one million dollar one constituency. See, when a policy is meant to fail, you will see it at the beginning. Here we are in a country where we talk about decentralization. And we've talked about the fact that central government has too much power, so we should decentralize to the base. And then you start by saying, I'll make available one million dollars per constituency per year. First of all, why didn't you do districts? Leave it aside. Let's continue. Then, the very thing that we talk about are saying there's too much power in the hands of the presidency. You decide to have development authorities, okay, which will become the first layer of centralized power. And then you have a ministry of special development initiatives, which become the next one, and mandated to report to the president. My brother, when you start like that, when you start like that, you're only telling all of us that you're giving us money with your right hand, you pass back, come and take it with your left. At the end of it all, the reason why you're giving us the money, nobody will feel it. Because we have talked consistently about the need to get monies to the base. We have talked about the fact that DCEs must be given a chance to determine what it is they want to do. And the whole idea of decentralization is one, informational advantage, two, proximity to the people, ability to know their consents, and even rivalry between districts or amongst districts would, en would ensure that if Ladade Kotopong is doing so well, um, AMA would also want to do more. Lekma would also want to do more. Because then they feel that the people in this district are doing better. And why shouldn't we do better? So you put in place measures. I'm sorry. What this government did was just to say, we're going to give you money. We will keep the money, buy things for you. And so when you ask them, they say, one, one district, one ambulance. When you ask them, we have built boreholes. Where are the boreholes? Oh, go to this place, go to that place. I am sure that if we give the districts the money, the districts, together with the assemblies, based on the medium-term development plan, which is approved by the National Development Planning Commission, would have done something better with this. For districts that have ambulances, they wouldn't have bought ambulances. I am not sure that all districts that bought ambulances that cost that much. Come on, it was meant so, to be like that right from the let's, let's return to the, I, I guess, the politics of this. And there's something that the reaction, the main reaction I got from all the minority members I spoke to was what they believed to be something the president didn't say, mm. which is his comment on the lives that were lost on the back of the elections and both minority leader, uh, the chief whip, make the point that the president, they expected the president to say something about it and, uh, and at least um, talk about the investigations that they expect to happen. What, what would you think is a valid point? Well, I think we are very often drawn into this, uh, this vortex of expectation becoming standard for measurement. 
So I remember it happened to me. You know, I was so involved in the um, Takradi girls story mm. that when the president of the state of the nation, after the story had broken and he didn't talk about it, I felt disappointed because I had an expectation that I should hear about this from my president. He didn't talk about it. I felt disappointed, but I had to reassess myself and understand that it was an expectation I had. Everybody has expectations. The president can't fulfill all of our expectations. There are times when he will not be able to talk about something simply because he has he has prioritized certain things that he thinks matter to more I people. Should it have been a priority for him? That in this is a good nation? question. Now, if you ask me, it should have. We've just come through an election. An election should never be the reason why someone dies. An election is actually a proof of people's power. So if you're powerful, why must they kill you? You know, so there is a certain irony in the fact that someone dies while trying to exhibit their power, the only power they have over leadership. So I feel that the president would have actually helped himself if he had made some bow or gesture towards them. But unfortunately, and I have to place some of the blame at the, foot, at the doorstep of the NDC. They have politicized those deaths. So now it feels to the NPP as if, if they touch those deaths, if they talk about them, they are playing into the hands of the NDC. And that is unfortunate. So that, that, the blame for that does have to fall on the NDC. They've made it a political issue. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, 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 the Winston, this is on the back of a very divisive election. The country is divided straight to the middle. Did the president seize the opportunity to unite the country, to, to sound conciliatory um, on the back of the outcome we just saw in the December 7? Well, while I'd say the president tried, I think that by touching on the killings and condemning it, it would have done him a lot more good. And I'll explain why. See, the president, I am not sure, sent anybody there to go and do that. Okay? And if you, the leader, you condemn it, institute investigations. Whoever is found to have done this is punished. And I repeat, punished. Not just to say we have started investigations, and then we all forget it. And every day when you raise the issue, then the government will bring another matter to divert attention. No. Start investigations, get whoever is behind this, punish the person, and then for those who lost lives, they will know that at least justice has been served. And for those who say you did it, would know that you didn't do it. Your inability to do so, for me, is not the best. And I think the president could have done more and could have, I mean, while he tried to say, well, it's okay that they're going to court and not doing all these things. That's the right way to go about it. When you have these things, you said about how people, but I, I sincerely did feel that the president had an opportunity to condemn this. Yeah. He had an opportunity. I mean, and, and an opportunity lost. Yeah, I mean, opportunity. could you do that same question? Did he seize a moment to sound conciliatory, unite a very divided country? You see, he did that in his acceptance speech, if you recall. Once uh, the EC declared that he was the president elect, he gave a speech that sounded, you know, uh, unitary. He was seeking to say that uh, he's going to be president for everyone, not just, you know, those who voted for him. He even re he, he repeated it at a church service recently. He said for the over six million people who didn't vote for him, he was still going to be their president. He was still so that perhaps that perhaps uh, was the tone that people would have been expecting today. But it is also possible that the president decided that this is not, this should not be so political a platform. And that if he's going to deal with the state of the nation, the word state is in there. So perhaps he should avoid uh, talking about government and politics. No, I mean, but, 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 but remember that the context on the back of I'm possibly the most divisive election we've ever had in I'm the fourth republic. And I agree that it would have been an opportunity for yeah. him to do so. I'm trying to explain why he perhaps decided decided to talk about other things. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Not I, mean I, I guess right I mean, my, my point is, Jenna, did this sound conciliatory enough for you? Uh, no, no. In fact, he actually took a few digs at his opponents. You know, when he talked about the fact that he's glad that the NDC has decided to go to court instead of break the law. You know, uh, so yes, there were a few digs in there. I don't think re uh, conciliatory was his aim at all. You know, uh, maybe this is the best place to do it at this time when we've come out of an election.
But um, I don't know. Maybe he plans to do that on other occasions. Maybe when he is. I have a follow-up uh, question to that. The um, minority chief whip made the point that the president consistently has said that the outcome of the parliamentary elections is it goes to show that the Ghanaians want us to talk more to build consensus, to reach yeah. out to each other. Yeah. And, and he, 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 talking to parliament. Yeah, and he and he says, presently saying that, but in the last few weeks, there has been nothing in terms of reaching out to the other side. Bearing in mind what is about to happen in the eighth parliament, there hasn't been any conversation. And he mentions an example, where Kwabene J in 2012, gathered them and, and they went to the M M MPP headquarters to sit with the MPP and have a conversation on the back of the, yeah. um, the dispute about elections. And that he was expecting that that sort of conversation, that sort of reaching out from the MPP to them would have happened and so they can begin to have a conversation going for. Is there a valid point? It's a valid point, but at the same time, I've got to tell you, I do not expect the next parliament to be conciliatory. I do not expect them to work together. I actually think they will struggle to go against their nature. Politicians, politicians in one way, are the most honest people you can find because they are always true to their nature. They can't even pretend not to be who they are. So if you are, if you are my political opponent, you are my political opponent. It is difficult for them to act as if they are not. You see, as if they are not fighting for that absolute power that the government of Ghana gives to a political party. So I, I really do not expect the next parliament to be as conciliatory as we imagine they will be. I think it will be fraught with conflict. I think there will be a lot of chess playing. I think there will be a lot of strategic undermining of each other. It's going to be interesting, but whether it will benefit the nation or not is to be seen. I'll tell you what else is to be seen. The size of the next government. Another thing I didn't hear much about in the state of the nation, you know, remember the president when he was criticized about having a large government when he had 110 ministers? He said the end justifies the means. Oh, you're so right. We the, are the end now. We're at the end. So has, has the, have the means been justified? Can we now say that, oh, now I get why we needed 120 ministers. Can we say that? And is that not part of the assessment of the state of the nation? I would have liked to hear him on it. But perhaps we only have to wait to see the size of his next government to determine whether he considers that he made the right decision or not. I mean, there's a lot to talk about. We also have to look at the, um, the parliament, the, 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 the architecture, the structure of it. I'll be speaking to both the um, leaders of the both sides in the reaction to the presence of the nation. They've given indications of what is going to happen. Um, but, of course, we'll talk about that shortly. The joint news coverage of the State of the Nation Address is brought to you by uh, DBS Colorlink Plus Roofing Sheet. After several years of intensive research, now DBS Industries Limited brings you roofing sheets to help complete your dream house in style. Experience the amazing touch of Colorlink Plus Roofing Sheets in 26 years, which means Colorlink Plus Roofing Sheets always stay clean and beautiful for you. And there's more. You are. We're giving you a whopping 20 years warranty against uh, fading and peeling. Visit DBS Industries Limited in Accra on the Spinters Road near Papaya Restaurant. Call us on our hotline 0543 286 637. 0543 286 637. And visit our other factories in Kumasi, Tamale, and Takrade. DBS Industries Limited will truly are uh, your roof experts. Now, uh, Winston, um, so the president came into the house and rightly sort of captures the mood of the 8th Parliament, which is about to, to unfold. And he said that he expects that the 8th Parliament will be a parliament like it, none other that we've seen. Um, however, we, they, they have already put forward their choice of speaker. Now, the minority side says they were not consulted in that process and they would have loved, as a part of the consensus building process, that at least give us heads up. Let's talk so we can have a consensus candidate, so to speak. Um, but as we've seen, the MPP had gone forward and put forward this and there are actually threats now that if the M NDC decides not to play ball and sort of let it go and suggest their own, then they'll deny them the other two slots. Are the, are the, I mean, what do you make of all that going into the yeah, next you know, you know, uh, 48 hours? It actually reminded me of uh, 2005 
when uh, Ken Jirasa, who was then the second deputy speaker, was hoping to be second deputy speaker again after Peter Alajete was brought in. But the rules of parliament is clear. I mean, you can't have the two deputies from the same party. And so at the time, Malik Al Hassan Yakubu was brought in as a second deputy speaker. Look, I, I, I think that based on what the NDC did in 2012, even when the MP had indicated they were going to go to court, you may say the minority is right, even though they had also indicated they're going to bring their own candidate anyway. But sometimes we say, open you die mante mante. See, the leader, when you are a leader, you sometimes, it is not everything that you, you hear. You sometimes pretend you haven't heard. So call them, speak to them, and tell them, Charlie, you know what? This is what we want to do. Even after deciding on Mike Okwe, what you do is that you get the majority leader currently to speak to the minority leader and tell him, Charlie, this is what we want to do. But maybe it's because of the NDC's posturing, where they had indicated that they are also in the majority. And mind you, we only would know who is in the majority uh, on, um, I mean, 7th January after the election of a speaker, and then we'll see. We'll no, but, but even that, I mean, we know several cases are still being um, Amehuz yes, 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 is that, one. Yeah, uh, yes, well, Amehuz, we're expecting verdict at 12 noon to, tonight, today. PM. So if that goes that way, we then would know whether or not the NPP has the majority or the NDC has majority, or there's no majority in Ghana's parliament. That's something that once the speaker is sworn in, as it stands now, the speaker will do, I mean, the decision that we're taking, I mean, the minority leader, the majority leader has talked about how uh, uh, they should understand the proceedings of Parliament. But look, I think that Parliament, 90% of the time, has consensus. Parliament, 90% of the time, has consensus. You think that would exist in the 8th Parliament? I told you something during the election coverage. I told you that it is either we will benefit as a people, the political parties will benefit, or the MPs will benefit. When I say the MPs will benefit, I, I, I believe you understand. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, you know, I am not in a hurry to say that this is good for us, the, I mean the citizenry. Because what happens in the first month will tell us what is really going to happen subsequently. It could be the case that um, a lot of lobbying